welcome everybody today we are going to talk more on the basics of macro photography along with few of the question and answer which you have submitted uh, let me start with what is a macro and the confusion usually people have between macro and close up now when we see all these pictures whatever you see here today are all captured by me so copyright belongs to me so please don't use these pictures elsewhere um, either as a screenshot or as a video now coming to uh, a picture something like this this is a starting of a macro that means at this magnification it is a macro whereas when you go to this one this is a close up it's not a macro people get confused what is a macro and what is a close up the the definition of a macro is that any picture that occupies a full size on a sensor is a macro now camera sensors differ for example both these pictures were captured using a crop sensor something like a 80d canon 80d or a d500 in uh, nikon uh, d7200 and that sort of uh, cameras so uh, they are all crop sensors so sensor sizes really change differ from one another for example a 35 mm sensor has got a 36 into 24 mm size whereas aps c sensors that is a crop sensors like the canon one is 22.2 into 14.8 mm so if i capture something which is 22 mm in size or larger that is considered as, as a macro whereas anything smaller than 22 mm then it is considered as a close up but in lay terms what people do is they don't bother much about uh, whether it's 1 is to 1 1 is to 2 1 is to 2 is to 1 they call everything as uh, macro so clear definition of a macro is it should be one is two now in a smaller sensor for example if you are using a mobile phone to capture a photograph then you can easily get a, a, a magnification that's why a lot of people are using those magnifying lenses in front of the mobile phones and capture if you are into macro videos probably mobile phones are better Uh, you, and you more useful than uh, dslrs while uh, using a full frame camera will give you a better quality of image but getting the magnification and the depth of field will be a tougher job the depth of field will i will be covering all those points later uh, now let me show you uh, what happens when magnification this is a ruler and i've used the atd to capture this now you can see that 22 mm is the the size of my sensor so if i get 44 this is about 44 so 1 2 3 4 44 mm so 44 mm will become 1 is to 2 magnification so it's a half size of a macro it's still not a macro so uh, let me go closer so now i'm reaching 1 is to 1.5 magnification if i go still closer i occupy something which is 22 mm so this is the area where the macro really starts until then what we were using or seeing are only close ups uh this is a very scientific technical uh, way of defining macro in common terminology anything which is close up is considered as macro now the question is how one of the questions which you asked was should we go for only macro lenses to get macro how do you get this higher magnification uh can you use a combination of lenses can you use something like extension tubes any other alternatives so i'll i'll cover up those technical part first before we delve into you know how do you really capture them how do you go closer how do you manage these insects if you are exclusively specializing on macro you might as well buy a macro lens 
Now, how does macro lens differ? So these are all the macro lenses, what you see, and they are from different companies. On the left hand side, you have Tamron, then you have a Canon, then you have a Sigma, then another Canon, this is a 180mm Canon, this is a 100mm Canon. And most of these lenses are at the range of 90 to 100mm. You know, Sony has a 90mm, which I use on my full frame uh, Sony cameras. Then uh, Canon, I used to use this 100mm on my Canon, Canon camera. This is Nikon 105 uh, uh, range, also comes into this same category, Sigma. This is a Sigma lens. Now, uh, this is a specialized macro lens. Now, what this does is, this is MPE 65, uh, made by Canon. This starts off at 1 is to 1. You know, I was talking about 1 is to 1 earlier. So the, the closest range where it can start is 1 is to 1. So this is absolutely no use to take any other photo. Whereas all these lenses can also be used as a normal lens. Now the difference between normal lens and a macro lens is macro lens is more specialized to give a macro type of, that is one is to one type of magnification. Some of them go beyond one is to one like this macro, macro lens. There are newer macro lenses which go into the similar, you know, more than one is to one. But all in all, when, when somebody says macro lens, it basically has to give one is to one. But there were few companies earlier who is to market something which is closer as a macro lens. That's a, that's a sort of, you know, fake marketing. It's not really worth it to buy those lenses for macro purposes. So if you are exclusively spending money on lenses for macro, you might as well spend on these macro lenses. They can be used as a normal lens also. I'll give you some other set of lenses. That's again, Tamron there. Uh, you have a Sony here. And this is another Zeiss lens. This is a Canon 50mm lens. Uh, there is also uh, so many other close-up lenses. This is Olympus. 60mm lens. So all these lenses help you to really go for macro. But if you don't have a macro lens, then you can use other lenses also. See, the difference between macro lens and other lenses is that macro lens allows you to focus much, much closer. Whereas a normal lens will not be able to um, focus, say, less than about two feet or three feet. Whereas a macro lens can go up to about, say, one feet, that's about 12 inches or even less. Some of them go very, very close. For example, this MPE 65 is in millimeters. So you have to have a subject somewhere very close by, then only you can take this uh, capture. I'll show you some of the photographs which I have captured using MPE 65. Now, uh, when you use other lenses, you can also modify them to become macro lenses. So one of the way of doing that is using what is called the extension tube. So this extension tube is basically a hollow tube. There is no glass here. So they come in different sizes. That's a 25 mm size. Then there, there's 20 mm size. And then 12 mm size, uh, various sizes. So you can stack one another and make it into nearly about 56 mm uh, larger size. Or you can remove uh, uh, the bigger one and make only these two or just remove both of them and just make one of them. As you wish, you can you can reduce or decrease, uh, increase the size depending on what you want. What they do is the normal lens will be fitted to this end and this will be fitted to the body. So it separates the lens from the body. So as you move the lens away from the body, the focusing of, of that particular lens characteristic changes. So you can focus much closer, much, much closer, so it becomes a macro lens. The disadvantage of using this extension tube is that your infinity focus goes off. So for example, you are doing macro and suddenly you find a bird somewhere in the nearby uh, tree, you won't be able to photograph that even though you are using a long telephoto lens with this extension tube. So infinity focus will be totally lost. To get the infinity focus, you have to remove these lenses and then you can use uh, uh, extension tubes. Now, uh, later I'll tell you one more uh, uh, device which can use, which can be used. It's called the Raynox magnifying glasses. 
some of my uh, slides have really messed up today so i'll show you one minute yeah this is one. this is uh, renox this is a magnifying glass this uh, is a dcr 250 renox glass the advantage here is you just fit it to the front of your existing lens so what that does is it just like a magnifying glass it magnifies the object this will magnify 2.5 times the object there is also a dcr 150 which magnifies 1.5 times so you can use any one of them the advantage is your lens characteristic is not changed only the subject get magnified and that's why you can use this as a macro lens on uh, several of the um, existing lenses now let me go to one of the questions why do you need a flash or why do you need a light why why can't you use a normal flash or why do you need to use a flash and how do you modify a flash that's what i'm going to answer with this question you know how to have a diffuse light because uh, this is asked by a person who is already practicing macro so he knows that you need have a light in fact having a flash is almost essential in macro photography the reason is we need as we go very very close to a subject our depth of field becomes very very shallow that's a law of physics and you can't change that so since depth of field is also controlled by aperture you can provide a very small aperture like f8 f11 f16 up to f16 you can go and get the best depth of field possible but as you reduce the the amount of light reaching the sensor by going for a very small aperture like f11 you need to have extra light the normal light which is there in the surrounding is not enough so that's why you need to have flash so one of the the easiest flash which uh, which is quite common which most of us are using is these godox flashes godox is a company which sort of revolutionized as far as the price of a flash as well as the quality of flash is concerned in the recent years nobody really buys a proprietary uh, sorry uh, company flashes for example the canon and nikon they all produce a good flashes but they are almost three times as expensive as these godox there's one more advantage of godox flash is that it uses a lithium ion battery just like your camera so the recharge time as well as time it takes between one shot and another shot is very very fast as compared to four wsls which most of the other uh, flashes use so and plus the price is around at the uh, this one this is a high end of version of uh, godox this is around 10 to 11000 rupees whereas the same featured a uh, canon or a nikon or a sony flash if you want to buy it will cost about 30 to 40000 so uh, this has advantage as far as uh, that is concerned as well as it mimics all the uh, facilities what you find in the proprietary camera flashes only difference is when you have a canon you have to buy a canon flash canon version of godox flash if you have a nikon camera you have to buy a nikon version otherwise the the hot shoe which fits into the the camera will not be compatible you can also go for uh, the the new version of godox that's that's a round headed flash but beware that many of the accessories are different between the rectangular head and a round head so this round head gives you a much better light this is also a slightly improved version compared to the previous one. or if you want to use something for flash uh, for macro only you can go to this you know two headed monster lights so this is uh, a light which is uh, produced by uh, uh, the company uh, yeah I, i'm not getting the name anyway it's a chinese uh, company basically it has got these two uh, it's and there is also a led light to help you focus the canon version is this uh, which i use mt23 24ex uh, quite an expensive flash but uh, very reliable uh, and it has got two heads and works fantastically uh, to give you a, a overall light which is covered 
Now, the TCR was the, the older. Coming to flashes. Now, using a direct flash straight away is going to give a very harsh light because you are very close to the insect and that light is unprotected. It just goes blasts on the insect. So you need to have some sort of modifiers. So these are all do-it-yourself modifiers which you can find on the uh, internet. And they, what they do is they diffuse the light so that the amount of light which is falling on the subject is not very, very harsh. It's a softer sort of light, something like an evening light or an early morning light than a mid-noon light. light. So that's why uh, uh, you can you can create your own. All you need is some uh, packing the food. See, this is basically a plastic food packing um, bowl, which is then covered with the styrofoam and uh, you know fixed to the flash. This sort of modifier is available. Uh, this is just a plastic modifier which just covers it. It is not very efficient. These are all uh, we did last time uh, in our group. Uh, do it yourself. You can do it. And then there is also a plastic modifiers which are available with the Velcro strip. Pringle boxes, you can convert them into a sort of a L-shaped um, modifiers. You can also use um, you know, some, some sort of uh, duct tape and uh, modifiers. And this is useful, especially uh, if you are doing uh, not just macro photography, but other type of photography, because you can add a, a polarizing filter, neutral density filter on, the, on top of the, the flash and get different effects. If you are into uh, oil drops on the water and that sort of macro photography, this will be a fun device to use. Or if you are inclined in not doing this, do it yourself and uh, buy it. One of my friend Varun is uh, has created what's called a beetle. He calls it a beetle uh, diffuser. I've used it recently for my curfew capture series. This was a series when the lockdown started on 22nd, uh, when the curfew was announced, the voluntary curfew was announced. I thought uh, I'll spend about two hours a day capturing macro in my backyard. So uh, my aim was, you know, in 21 days, I'll capture something like 50 insects. Uh, I got more than 80 species of insects in my backyard itself. So uh, if somebody asks you where to find a macro photography, go to your backyard, backyard and start looking under the leaves. Obviously, you'll find a lot of macro. So this is a beetle uh, modifier. This is quite a uh, nice one. Uh, it's uh, it comes out folded, and then you have to have uh, you know just have got a buttons. You just press all the buttons. There is also a small um, LED light which illuminates that helps you to focus. There is a white uh, diffuser in front, which is sort of a concave. So that again helps you. And if you don't want a shadow under the insect, you use this particular modifier. You can also remove this modifier and put it on top. If you don't want that, you know, if you want the shadow, because there are users who find that, you know, having a shadow will give you sort of a subject, a place where, where it can stand. But there are people who think that, you know, that shadow also has to be eliminated. So it depends. So if you don't want a shadow, you use this. If you want a shadow, then you use uh, you remove this. Uh, you can contact him. He's on Facebook, uh, Varun HB. Now, coming to you have got the camera, you got the lens, you got the flash, you got the diffuser. Now you have to find the insect. Now, once you find the insect, how do you get the plane of focus? Where do you find the plane of focus? How do you focus it? How do you align it? How do you move towards it? How do you focus the insect? So this is all looks pretty complicated, you know, just to explain. But in field, it is easy once you get, get to know how you do it. So here is a diagram how to capture. Remember, this diagram is not up to scale. I have not found an ant which is as big as a camera. 
just to show you the picture so how do i focus uh, now let's assume that i have a diffuser which probably is most of the time it's connected to my hot shoe not standing on the side i may use tripod may not use tripod my usage of tripod is something like this if the insect is stationary if it is cooperative then i use tripod the advantage of a tripod is that it gives me much more stability but if in insect is very finicky if it is roaming around running around then it is no use chasing that insect using a tripod you are going to create more havoc than without using a tripod so most of the time i use camera handheld so i have a diffuser and a flash which is fitted to the hot shoe of the camera now when i see the insect i don't use the auto focus mode in the camera what i do is i put the camera on the manual mode i switch off the image stabilization you can call it is in canon or vr in nikon os in sony and all those terminology just switch it off because when you are going that close and trying to hold your camera still the camera inside starts thinking that you know there is a vibration and it will start um, compensating it even though there is no vibration so you don't need um, image stabilization for macro photography so think about this the image stabilized macro lenses are expensive there are a lot of non image stabilized macro lenses which are cheaper so since anyway you are going to switch off the image stabilization you might as well go for a non image stabilized lenses which are cheaper and uh, which are easier to manage now when i approach uh, insect there are several angles of uh, how do you approach i'll i'll show you how you approach them but basically what i am doing is i am moving my camera forward and backward i'm not really using a focusing ring at all so i have fixed my focus to a point and then i move camera forward and backward so that the subject comes into focus so when the subject comes into focus especially the eye of the subject comes into focus then i click and this is how the image will look so this is a very shallow depth of field image where only the eye of the ant is in focus now when the eye of the ant is in focus you can see the hind legs are out of focus the fore legs are out of focus just the eye just a little bit of the antenna is in focus now this is a shallow depth of field what you get when you go extremely close and this close okay so this is good if you just want to show the eye of the insect this is fantastic when it comes to spiders because jumping spiders have got a beautiful eyes and they look at the camera they look at you and they give you a particular look which looks very very fascinating so when you try to show a subject with just the eyes then this sort of angle looks very good most people go for this angle it's a same in same uh, ant so i moved it moved myself sideways i didn't change the depth of field so what i got is a shallow depth of field but whole ant is covered now compare the previous picture and this picture so what do you see this picture has a better uh, depth of field even though everything remains stationary same the aperture is same shutter speed is same usually the shutter speed i keep is 160th of a second aperture it varies depending on uh, the insect subject and subject distance uh usually it is uh, you know uh, f8 to f16 now next comes this side now in this angle you see a slightly more something different has happened this is what we call as a magic angle in uh, macro photography if you search for magic angle macro photography you don't get anything i don't know what other people call it but this is i consider it as a magic angle this is around uh, 30 to 45 degrees angle in all three direction that is x y and z axis of the subject so that angle gives me a head which is in focus that 
the tail end which is in focus and also many of the legs in focus so that way uh, uh, you can get a better uh, image now here i have not increased the depth of field the depth of field is controlled by the aperture as well as how close you are so in this case uh, the uh, aperture was f uh, i think 6.5 Uh, because i wanted very shallow depth of field that's why i went for 6.5 normally i go for f8 or f11 now i'll show you another picture which is this now this is using a flash so i have put the flash and this antlion which has now become a lace wing um remember those antlions uh, in the sand where we we used to play around that becomes as an adult as this a graceful insect it's got a wing which is very shiny iridescent with all the flash and all the diffusers every trick i was playing it was reflecting the light back the wing was reflecting the light back so even with the soft box the effect was not good enough so finally i had to use a polarizing filter to get the effect something like this fortunately the antlion was stationary it was waiting for me so i was able to go back and get a polarizing filter put it across and then get rid of that that violet tinge what you saw so there are several ways in fact you know the macro photography is the amalgamation of various other photography genres so the polarizing filter which i learned in landscape photography also came useful while shooting insects so this is just one example of how do you use a uh, lot of uh, techniques to get at the end the better picture so for me that uh, you know most of these uh, are right at the camera they are not manipulated i can i can always would have you know gone to a photoshop removed that tinge easily but that's not my intention most of my photographs you see at the most i use lightroom just to crop and uh, Uh, do some of the uh, finishing touches but i don't manipulate any of the pictures now wh what do you see in a picture so in a macro photography the plane of focus is basically to tell something about the insect now here the insect is sort of sleeping hibernating this is a wasp it sleeps in the night on dry twigs so i wanted to capture the wasp wasp and also capture the night so the background is black uh, even though there was a bright light here there is a wall here the background is black because i could go close and put a flash and the flash was not good enough to reach the background so that's the advantage of making something black whereas if you want a picture something like this where you, where the background needs to be green not black you first adjust your parameters to the sunlight in the background and then use flash so when i use flash in such a way i get both the background well lit as well as the subject well lit here the background has gone dark because i focused only on the foreground subject so in the advanced classes probably i'll explain you how to do both these things but that's how you really look for the subject and then Uh, express the subject in the way you want it to be expressed now you don't have to show the whole subject in a macro photography even a very small area really makes a lot of difference this is a caterpillar i could have shown the whole caterpillar but i just wanted to show only the head of the caterpillar and the leaf behind it so that is basically how you want to show the subject so that is your idea of you know presenting the the subject you need not go through the standard way that i'm going to show a caterpillar whole caterpillar from head to toe and all the surrounding allow uh, that is up to you if you want to show you can show you can also show something upside down like like this uh, spider which was very curious about my uh, my photography and came and gave a pose and if you see in its eyes you can see twin lights this twin light twin lights are basically the the empty 24 ex flashlight 
which are basically twin lights and they are, they are being shown in the eye as as a twin light. Uh, remember on the internet there are a lot of pictures of insects with water drops on top many a times they are pet insects where they put a water drop using a dropper and then take a shoot but if you really go into the rainy season and try to capture them in in their web so this jumping spider had a drop of water on top of it and it was you know wishing me with the these drops which were there just rain it just rain in the morning and then we had a, a waterfall workshop in a place called mala and this was a capture in in the forest always when you capture a subject it's better to capture with something it's doing so that way you are telling another story it's not just about the insect it is also about the what it is doing so here i can see uh, this damsel fly is eating another insect and with that i could capture and this is that same magic angle i was talking about which got me a, a very good capture and also you can go for you know this is not a macro lens i was using a non macro lens on a fuji camera to capture this uh, mosquito on a natural light this is using a natural light i, I didn't use a flash so there was a sunlight which is falling on the leaf and the mosquito was sitting so this is the maximum distance i could go to capture it i couldn't go closer than that whereas if i had a macro lens i can do this i can go this close and capture the mosquito and most of us don't go that close and look at the mosquito's uh, color it has got a iridescent blue color so the flash really enhances it so i didn't remove that blue but i just wanted to show you that that blue color and some of the spiders are beautiful in in a totally different way so you can go extremely close to them and uh, do a capture this is a very common spider in the garden lucage type of spiders so you can go and capture them it builds a nest late evening so you have to go after sunset just to hunt for these uh, beautiful spiders this is a literary uh, nymph it's a plant hopper nymph nymph i found it on a leaf so then i uh, picked it up and got it and put it on a, a white sheet of paper just to you know show the transparency but unfortunately even with the white sheet of paper the transparency was not obvious enough so the next trick what i did was this put a flash under the paper so that it passes through the it's almost like a x ray picture you can see how transparent it is remember i don't harm these insects i just take a photograph and then leave it most of the time most of my photographs are in the wild i don't bring them into a studio i don't do a setup uh, like many people who do they put it in a fridge they they sedate the insect and then take a photography that's that's unethical that should not be done you can do it uh, sort of a studio in the wild itself put some flashes put some uh, studio lights you can create environment around that so this is one situation after this i, I left it back in the wild in the same leaf where it was uh, living there is another trick to avoid having you know shallow depth of field for example this fly i was capturing Uh, the depth of field was not enough like i couldn't get the hind wings correctly so uh, there is a trick called focus stacking so i'll show you the image this is the first image this is where i was focusing point of focus is here so the second picture the point of focus is here and the third picture the point of focus is somewhere at the back sorry uh, this next picture the point of focus is in the back so when you combine all of all three of them then you get this one so there are softwares which uh, photoshop is one of them and zerin uh, stacker is another one which allows you to stack these images together and make it into a one single image only 
problem is the insect has to stay still if it's moving around you won't be able to get um, a perfectly good stack so this is unstacked picture so you can see i concentrated more on the face but a little bit of the back is, is out of focus but it's fine because most of the part of this flesh fly is basically the face and the red eyes so that's where you concentrate and then you, you see okay. now how do you approach a subject this is a tough one the reason is many of the times the insects are afraid of you a uh, humans we have destroyed insect world in such a way that every insect hates us now there is a way of avoiding it one is to wear masks so now we are used to wearing masks and one of the best mask available for photographers is a camera now with the camera in front of your face you can approach a insect very very close as close as this so normally when you go very close as as close as this the dragon flies usually run off that is because they can see your face and they know that you are a human and then they know that you are going to either uh, kill it or harm it so that's why they'll run away so at the most you will get a picture something like this but if you want a head on picture something like this go as close as possible that is only possible by holding a camera in front of your eyes don't ever bring down the camera just hold it in front of your eyes and then keep moving forward and forward until you get exact focus on the eyes on the face or wherever you want this is a very shallow uh, focus uh, this thing concentrating only on the eyes and and the mouth parts or if you want the regular shot you can go for the side and then approach always look for insects which are doing something for example here there are mating beetles so the beetles can be approached uh, quite variably with using various techniques in this case unfortunately i didn't have a diffuser but i had a flash so i want to show you you know what happens when you use a, a diffuser without any modifier so since i didn't have any modifier what i did was i took my handkerchief tied it in front of the flash and tried to use it that is a sort of a diffuser make uh, yourself diffuser sort of thing because i could get the mating but i didn't have the tool in with me now you can see on a shiny surface it still reflect okay then you try to change the angle so this is the magic angle i was trying to but then i tried going for the top shot but top shot also resulted in having lot of shiny uh, this thing because these uh, these leaf beetles are very shiny so uh, it's very difficult to avoid without having a good uh, diffusing material or a or a soft box so you can start taking different angles now one of the mistakes what most people do as far as any photographer is concerned not just macro is get satisfied with one single uh, image and then think okay we i got the fantastic image i don't want to try any more all you have to do is go around and then you'll get various other angles and this was the final angle i got where one of the beetle is looking at me the other one is sort of you know shy and they're still mating and the beetle mating is uh, quite a uh, common phenomena and in fact i have written a blog on how they really mate and their genital parts are like like a saw so if you want any details you can check my website where i have uh, talked about this particular image you can also get some of the images here these red ants the they are capturing another ant they killed it and they are transporting it to the web so there are two images here there are only two ants which are basically 
carrying that luck or there are more than two hands the problem what happens is uh, there is what's called a rule of third this is what most people follow and then they don't think of any other rules there are thousands of rules this is what's called a rule of odds if there are four subjects then usually people lose interest if it is three people have better interest so i just concentrated on two red ants carrying one black ant that that will be a better picture compared to the the previous one so you have to think of compositional values you have to think of angle of light here the angle of light is coming from this angle it's not coming from the camera side so that's why it gives you that particular look what i was doing is i had a trigger on my camera and i was holding my flash as well as uh, the diffuser on my left hand and directing the light as i want so that's how i captured this now i was showing you that extremely magnified magnifiable lens called uh, mpe65 this is a capture using that mpe65 what you are seeing here is our aphids they are very very tiny small aphids and they are being attacked by a ladybug larvae so uh, these um, insects here and they there you are the ladybug larvae are attacking and uh, feeding on these aphids so the aphids are basically you know they suck sap out of uh, plants and uh, they are quite harmful for the plant so these ladybug larvae uh, basically kill those uh, aphids and then feed on them so this this is extreme close now you may be thinking that i need to invest so much i need to get all those uh, lenses to come with you know good macro setup think initially i told you about close up and macro so you need not go for the macro as such macro is a separate genre itself and most of the time you you need to be spending quite a lot on on these lenses and other equipment but if you don't have uh, macro lenses still you need to have some ideas you can stick with close ups look through patterns look through uh, various uh, things which nature provides us this was a series which i wanted to have the leaf pattern as well as ant now here the light is from the other side so the, i have used the flash i put the flash on the back of the leaf so the light is passing through the leaf and the ant is on this side but what you are getting as a an ant is just a silhouette of ant you can't see details of ant but only a black structure of ant so check few of the photographs i'll just pass them pretty fast this is a series of photographs showing ants as well as leaf patterns or you can do a portrait of ant here what i really did was a studio portrait i put a 90 cm soft box and a 8200 lens near a track of these weaver and uh, who are going up so as they were passing i was taking photographs so uh, it's it's a trial and error you can't really focus because they'll be running across this particular vine the only advantage is they they had no space to go away so each time they passed i was getting one picture at a time so this is what i called as a portrait of an ant there are several of them i'm not going to bore you with that just showed you one one picture just to show you uh, how we can use a large soft box and a studio light to make a portrait of an ant or if you are patient enough you can go and capture something like this a capture of a spider capturing a mosquito so this is what this question really begs to answer 
So how we can compose to get an interesting photograph when the bugs are moving so much? I agree, bugs do move so much, but they have a purpose on their movement. So either they'll be feeding on something, they are going hunting something. So once you understand that particular bug and learn the life history of that particular bug, you can anticipate what they do. For example, that day in the evening, I was trying to take photograph of this spider. And at that same time, when I was shooting this, I was getting bitten by mosquitoes. So invariably, I was thinking one of the mosquito might really go and fall into the web of this particular tetragonal. So I waited there and soon enough, I saw a mosquito falling into the nest. And immediately the spider came. So I captured the mosquito as it was falling in the nest, uh, net web. And then the spider came and started pouncing on that, bit the mosquito, and then started building a nest, uh, building a spider web around it. So it creates a cocoon around the spider web. And that's a cocoon which is being created. And I was constantly shooting this one after the other. I could have created a video, but I, I, I always find it's much more comfortable to create a sequence of photographs than doing a video. And there it is, fine. So this is next sure. So that was the final uh, moment. The mosquito was then sucked in by the spider. Then I had to leave. I also got quite a lot of mosquito bites, but this mosquito kill was really worth that, that price. You can also get, you know, you, if you start chasing ants or spiders, you will get uh, to see these fantastic images of, you know, one ant trying to kill another ant, trying to take it uh, to feed the nest. This is a spider where there was uh, sort of a history that, you know, it used to kill few people uh, using its bite. It's, it's called a toilet seat spider. Uh, it was way back, much before internet started. People used to send some emails of this fake story that, you know, this is an Indian spider which came to US and uh, in America it's hiding in one of the airport's uh, toilet seats and it's killing people. People believed and they started destroying toilet seats in those airports. So that is probably one of the first such fake news which uh, spread around. So this spider, Simonia spider, I wanted to photograph as though it's sitting in a toilet seat. Now I can't carry this spider and put it in a toilet seat. So I was looking for a moment where I could get a spider sitting next to a leaf which looked like a toilet seat. So um, this is the series which I created and uh, you can see that. Again, you can see, if you see the eyes of the spider, you can see twin lights. Those are the, the twin lights what I used to capture. This is a thorn mimic tree hopper. It's got a thorn like structure on the head. So uh, when the birds who try to you know, capture that, come to find this particular insect, they think that it's a thorn and they just leave it. This sucks uh, sap out of the plant. So this is called a thorn. In fact, from this angle, you can see only one of, one of the thorns. It's in fact, it's two thorns, thorn-like structures on the head. It's just a sort of a mimic to save its own life. Next question was, uh, any tips of the time of the day? or a year on when one can get specific type of bugs. I mean, I recently observed a butterfly out in the morning and afternoon, but not in the evening. All these insects have got their own routine, their own timing of the day. Most of them are early morning or late evening. If you are a late riser or an early sleeper, you will miss this fun at all. For a macro photography, you sleep in the afternoon, wake up early morning, or wait till late, late night. Because morning and evenings are the best time where these insects will sit and wait for the sun to rise because their body heat mechanism requires some amount of energy from the sun. So when it's really cold, they are sluggish. So you can easily capture them 
using uh, in early morning or late evening. Having said that, many of the dragonflies are more active in the afternoon. So depending on the insects, the spiders are more active in the night. So depending on the insects you are looking for, start studying their behavioral pattern. And with that, you can get uh, to find out where they exist, where they are uh, going to stay, and how you can capture them. Now, for example, I was showing you weaver ants. Okay, there is a spider which mimics that weaver ant, and this is that spider. So this is an ant mimic spider, and it also has a, a fantastic looking back end, but looks like a joker. So something like this. So you can capture that ant mimic spider in a manner how you normally capture any of the spiders, or you wait for the, the ant mimic spider to move around. So you sit in one place, let the insects start moving around, and then capture various moods and styles of that particular insect. So here are a few of them I just captured. Similarly, here there is a uh, beetle, and this is what I call as a magic angle. This angle allows you to capture most of the insect. It's not on the front, it's not on the side, it's not on the top. It is at 45 degrees in all, th all three directions. So this allows you to capture most part of the insect without getting blurry. So now the leaf is blurry, but the insect is sharp and contrasting. Another thing you have to notice is the background. Whether the background is sort of, you know, this is a insect and the background is complementary. So it's, it's uh, opposite of orange, the green there. So obviously this insect will stand out. But I'm not satisfied with one single picture, something like this. Now here I was using a large softbox similar to what is uh, the beetle softbox, but this is not a beetle softbox. This is a do it myself a softbox, which um, I created long back. This gives uh, slightly better uh, results than uh, whatever I have created till now. Uh, I can give a particular model idea how to do it. Many of my friends have already created them. So this gives a fantastic results. You can see the light, which is just skimming across and very soft. So this is one angle, but I'm not satisfied. So I wait there, start looking <coughs> at the insect from different angle. Start going low. Start looking from below the insect so that you can look at the underside of the insect as though insect is looking at you. Or you go behind the insect and then look at the leaf. Or you go on top of the insect so that you look how the insect is looking at something else. You can go behind the insect, you can go side of the insect, you can also go back into the same angle. Or you can go full flat on the insect and showing that four, four um, black spots. Or you can go to the side of the insect. So this is basically, I have answered most of the questions. So if you have any questions, you can ask me in the um, chat, I'll answer. So that's my most of my presentation. If you have any doubts regarding these questions, you can ask me in the chat. Let me go to the chat and start reading them. Okay, I think I have answered what is macro. If you go magnification higher than one is to one, then only it's called a real macro. But in layman term, anything close up and macro is both called a macro. Does a beetle diffuser fold flat so that it can be carried in a bag? Yes, it, it flow, uh, it's like almost like a file, it will flow, fold up. So you can carry it. Only thing is it's about uh, 15 inches. So you have to carry it in a suitcase. Uh, it may be difficult to carry in a camera bag. Uh, but it can be folded slightly and put it in a cap. No, not a problem.
I have a Godox LED light. Can this be used for macro photography? Uh, LED lights are constant lights. The problem with the constant light, it's yes, it can be used. There is no harm in using it. Uh, uh, but you need to have a diffuser. That's one. The second thing is you need to keep a higher shutter speed. Probably that will sort of go against the the power of the the LED lights. Most of these LED lights are not really that bright enough. If it is bright enough, probably you should be able to use it straight. Are focus stack like images accepted in photo contest? If it is a photo contest which says that you know you can't edit them, no, they won't. Uh, but if it is a photo contest which allows you to edit, yes, stacked images are allowed. In most of the extreme macros, you people only use stacked images. And stacking, there is a st stacking uh, software as well as stacking machine, which allows you to stack hundreds of photographs together. How do you get a black background? Is it because the low power of the twin lights? Uh, if you are something like this, uh, your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO settings, if you make sure that with the flash off, you take a picture and the picture comes out totally dark, black, then your background will be black because that is what the background is. The ambient light is managed by the the background and the flash only manages the foreground. Your subject is in the foreground. So I think uh, one of these days we'll talk about, you know, how do you use flash and what is uh, ambient light versus the flashlight uh, configuration and how it really, you know, merges with one another. So that will give you a, a whole idea. How do you make a background go black or background go like what is here? Okay, Santil is asking, what's the best aperture to shooting macro? There is no such thing as a best aperture. For example, there are a lot of people who are shooting macro bird, uh, sorry, macro flower photography, where they want very little part of the petal of the flower to be in focus and the rest of the flower to go out of focus. They'll be using like f2.8. For them, that, that works because only a very small area of the flower needs to be in focus. Whereas if you are shooting an insect, something like this, you need to have uh, something close to say F8, F11. You can go up to about 5, 14 aperture. So there is no single aperture which is good enough. So if you want a deeper depth of field, go for a smaller aperture. If you want a shallower depth of field, go for a, a wider uh, aperture. That depends on how close you are. So if you are far away, then the aperture really changes uh, the depth of field. If you are close by, again, the aperture and depth of field, both of them change. So depth of field is basically on, on how much of subject to camera distance is there plus the aperture. These two parameters are part of depth of field. So that depth of field is the one which gives you this particular uh, idea of what to use. There is no hard and fast rule that you have to use something else. You can, can we do stacking in uh, Lightroom? No, Lightroom doesn't allow you to do stacking. You need to go to Photoshop to do a stack. What will be the percentage of post-processing for macro photography? In my case, I use only Lightroom, unless if I'm doing the stacking. I also use another stacking program called Zirin Stacker if I'm doing a stacking. I don't use Photoshop to manipulate anything. And 99% uh, of my work is in Lightroom itself. 1% of work, you know, there may be some spots which I want to remove or somewhere if the light uh, light is really causing too much of harshness, I want to reduce that. Probably at that time, I may go to uh, Photoshop, but uh, recently for last two to three years, I'm using only Lightroom for most of my work.
Santil is also asking, uh, while doing macro, because of the wind, focus is hunting. Can we use uh, AI servo mode in such a case? Uh, you can use AI servo mode. It is possible, but I think most of the time your camera will fail. Ideally, what you can do is you keep a sort of a wind preventer uh, on the other side. Or the trick what I use is I hold my camera on one hand. That is a right hand, I hold my camera. Left hand, either I hold my flash with the diffuser or sometimes I hold the leaf. For example, this leaf is moving around in the wind. What I do is I hold the part which is not visible in the camera with my left hand and then I focus. So if your camera and all the setup is too heavy, then you won't be able to do that. And I also use a hand strap, which takes most of the weight out of uh, my hand. So I'm not really carrying the camera. I'm just holding the camera. So that's what I'm uh, using. Okay. He, uh, Venkat is asking, if we use a powerful zoom lens and stand far away, can we simulate macro lens? Even if uh, partially, yes, you can catch photos of insects without them moving away from us when standing close. Yes, it is possible, but you won't be able to get macro level because most of these uh, uh, zoom lenses take 100-400 lens. Say either Canon or a Sony 100-400 lens allows you 1 is to 4 magnification, not closer than that. So you can only go to 1 is to 4 magnification. So you can't go to 1 is to 1 magnification like these macro lenses. Now, this remember, this is not a crop. This is a full frame. When I went this close, I captured this insect in this full frame. I didn't crop this image. So all these images are, are full frame images. They might have been very little crop somewhere, but it's very marginal crop. So this sort of close up is not possible in any one of the uh, zoom lenses. But using extension tube, you will be able to uh, use extension tubes, stay far away, not as far away as a normal zoom lens, but you should be able to get as close as this. Uh, you can probably get a 1 is to 2 magnification, that is half size magnification, using uh, uh, zoom lenses with the extension. Any other question? Yeah, Babu is asking, modern cameras having an eye focus option, will this be usable in spider photographs or macro lenses? Autofocus utterly fails in macro. So never try to do autofocus because uh, it cannot un understand uh, the eyes as good as you know, normal animal eyes or human eyes. I don't know. I haven't tried uh, Sony animal eye on uh, insects. Uh, I'll try it on and see. But my uh, idea of a macro photography is not using autofocus at all. So that's why even uh, using AI servo mode and other autofocus all fails. The surefire way of focusing an uh, insect is go into manual focus, fix the focus of the lens using the focusing ring, and then bring the camera forward and backward until the insect comes into focus. So that is the best way of focusing uh, for any insect. That's easiest way also. Since most of us come from other genres where autofocus is in use, like sports photography or uh, action photography, we think that you know uh, that that same sort of focusing mechanism works in macro, but I think the this method I have tried and tested over the last eight to nine years of macro photography, various techniques, but this is the one which really holds good. Let me show you one or two slides. If you are interested in spiders, uh, there is a webinar coming up on next Friday, me and Javed Ahmad are doing an online Zoom seminar. So if you are interested in uh, introduction to common uh, spider families in genre and uh, natural history observation uh, and the importance of reporting them and a uh, question and answer, you can check this particular uh, webinar. It's on next Friday, 6th, 6th of June. Same time, 7 to 9. Uh, if you want any of the details, sorry, electricity went off, but uh, we'll come back now.
so if you want to know more about this uh, whatever slides which i have shown they are all there in my blog drkrishi.com so you can check uh, my blog for detailed versions of each one of them there i have given how i captured them what are the settings all the exhibit information is available all you have to do is just click on the the image it will pop up and at the bottom you see the exhibit information so if you want to know what aperture i used what shutter speed what camera what lenses what flash i used everything is there with me that much and my, uh, my website also has lot of information about macros so if you are interested just please go through this website drkrishi.com i've been blogging almost every week since 2006 mostly on animals and uh, wildlife and lot on macros uh baso when we are using manual focus we need to adjust the adapter which is not so accurate uh i didn't get it what adapter are you talking about most of the time we you go for the closest focus in the focusing grip so let's assume that you know your closest focus is about a 1 feet distance so you put your camera to the closest focus and then go forward and back backward uh, i don't think it's adapter Uh, really makes that much of a difference adapter is basically used for the viewfinder that's where the adapter is i think you are confusing adapter with something else so you mentioned switching off the is yes yes shajin switching off the is is the most important part one of the reason why you get a shaky macro photographs is because of the is it is counteracting with what you are doing I also have a old Nikon 28105D lens, which uh, gives a switch for the macro mode from a normal mode. Yes, it is effective. So when you switch on to a macro mode, it allows you to go closer. It is not the true macro, but it allows you to go much much closer. It will give you probably one is to two. I'm not very sure, but uh, probably one is to two magnification. So which is not possible in a normal mode. 24 to 70 mm f4 lens in Canon and 28 to 105 d lens in Nikon. These both allow you to go for the macro mode. Shikant is asking when we are using manual focus, we need to adjust the adapter, which is not so accurate. I'm not. Uh, I think he's repeating that particular question. now uh, basavraj is call, asking a question there are uh, telephoto lenses with macro capabilities how they work this is a fake marketing they are not really macro lenses they are just marked as a macro lenses they are not there was uh, a really a uh, fashion in the early days with any of the lens which had a quite a close focus close focus in the sense yeah, one meter one meter sort of uh, closer focus calling that particular lens a macro lens recent years that particular trend has gone off now uh, they are not asking that particular uh, question can we use a live mode for macro yes live view is another big boon in uh, recent days especially if you have a tiltable uh, screen something like 80d 90d uh, can where where you can tilt and keep it at, at a particular angle as you are going low in fact most of these insects are at the ground level so your camera will be at the ground level remember you have to at the eye level of the insect when I, when i am shooting something like this i am at the eye level of the ant so that particular uh, insect uh, picture requires you to be at that eye level and you using a viewfinder will be pretty difficult initially i used to use um, a sort of adapter for the viewfinder which allowed me to see something like a periscope i still have that i don't use it now but uh, if anybody wants uh, to use it on a canon um, cameras i can i can uh, give it to you uh, since i'm using sony now sony and olympus so uh, it's of no use for me i still keep it with me doctor you also would would like to highlight on people yes, being right fit. angle viewfinder yes i have a right angle viewfinder yes okay uh, uh shikant i didn't get your question can you can you repeat yeah, it i mean for uh, macro one of the most uh, more important aspect is 
being fit and fine because when you when you are down at that angle and waiting for the ant for minutes together you really have to be fit and fine yes that gives me that but i exercise what i need so i usually put a mat underneath uh, my body uh, if i'm if i'm uh, lying down for a long time usually yoga mat what you get in uh, in any of the malls are fine that will help you not getting wet from the ground also it will avoid uh, having a sore knee because the, if you uh, squat for a very long time on a hard soil and wait for this i mean most of uh, my macro sessions last about a uh, half an hour to one and a half hours per insect so that's why it's uh, i spend quite a lot of time to capture the insect in, a, in the perfect way i want it so that's why uh, you know you have to be fit you have to have you know less of a tummy which i still have sometimes it works as a cushion um and then uh, you have to be fit so it gives you a motivation to be fit plus it also helps you uh, in this apart from shooting for passion love and hobby can we go into the commercial area unfortunately not many people really want to buy a ant or a spider picture to hang on their wall but macro photography also has a lot of other genres which are built into it smoke photography is one of them oil uh, on water photography is another product photography with extreme macro for example watch components uh, all those things are part of macro photography so uh, you will be able to use that particular option to really get exactly what you want we know this asking yes need to be fit and fit a uh, lots of practice to hold breath minimum 10 seconds or oh, 10 seconds I, i i hold breath nearly 30 seconds to get that capture that time you will be holding breath because even breathing slightly will cause a hand to shake and with that your macro will go for a toss and this i realized especially after i shifted to my sony a7r4 this is a 60 megapixel monster so what happens here is even a microscopic shake will be visible in the picture initially first 20 days of after purchasing that particular camera all i was getting was a blurry picture despite my, my experience with so many years of practice i was thinking you know there is something wrong with the camera itself and uh, i had to give it back but then i realized my technique has to improve along with the the uh, number of pixels which are there in the camera so more pixels you have more trouble you have so you can blow up this picture you know into a, a huge stadium sized uh, picture uh, photo, photo at the end while you are printing but you have to have proper technique and that technique comes with practice lot of exercise lot of patience and that keeps you quite healthy as well as uh, you know uh, the the happiness what you get after a session of a macro photography is uh, so interesting it's you know it's difficult to express thank you i think uh, we'll call it a day